nothing like scurrying on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Ah. Hello, Councillor Panamara. Hi, Elaine. Thanks for that nifty spreadsheet. Yeah, it is nifty, isn't it? But we never updated the uh, the website, I think. Uh, with the, the latest impact numbers. Yeah, maybe not. Um, I, I don't update the website, so I don't know. You know, if the packet, uh, the packet that we had at the meeting on the 21st, I think had that in it. But, oh, okay. I'll just look for if it's if it's all there in the packet. Yeah. Uh, then I'll just. I found. Take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing some edits on that report as we go through this um, work that we're doing now. So there there are some small changes, but the overall <coughs> impacts tables are correct. <coughs> Excuse me. The one table of impacts after amendment. Um, had some numbers that I needed to change just in the education category. Um, so I've, I've got it changed in my draft now, but I hate to have so many drafts floating through because I never, nobody ever knew, uses or knows what, what is the correct draft, so. Yeah, I hear that. Others may not know how to get to this meeting. So I just heard from the mayor and she's, uh, I, I let her know that just to use the one that, that we sent in the email. Council Pernamoff, question. Yeah. Were you able, did you receive a invitation to this meeting via Zoom? I didn't get the Zoom, a Zoom invite. So that's why I went to the, the agenda and just clicked on the, um, the general link. Um, I don't think any of us got, got Zoom invites. I didn't either, Hector, and um, I don't know if I can share my screen, but if you can make sure I can, um, that would be okay, great. So no, you have to leave. I, I'm looking at the Zoom settings now, and I, uh, I sent emails to everyone, but, you know, it, it must, I did it last week, so it could have just been. Oh, yeah, if it was last week, I didn't look that, right. I'm that sorry, far. I'm sorry. I meant earlier in the week. Apologies. I thought it... still yeah. I I may have I came up well, you know in my searching and I didn't I didn't find one. So I don't know for sure if I got one. So anyway, Hector, if you can make sure I get one for Monday. I'm I'm good for now and just need to be able to share screen. Okay. Yeah, I just got that, the Zoom in fight. So I, I just resent to everybody just in case the okay. mayor's logging in. And also Councilor Byers, is that correct, Councilor Panamaro? Yeah, and actually, and uh, Councilor Pestizo is the alternate. And the others have been, some of the others have been coming, so um, we should make sure they have. Yeah, I think we can have other, um, yay, there's Councilor Pestizo. I think we could have others as the, um, you know, promote them to panelists, uh, even though they're not necessarily members of the subcommittee. Um, uh, uh, Colette uh, Parry-Miller let me know that um, she is doing some TPAC work 
um, and not able to attend. Otherwise, she would also be here. And I don't see any other folks in the attendees um, that are on the board. So I would say we have everybody that we're going to have. <laughs> you guys, I do want to let you know that I've taken a uh, kind of a, a downturn today, so I'm still sick. I'm just going to stay uh, dark, uh, but I will be attending. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and call the special me uh, special meeting to order, um, and then we'll ask uh, alternate Pastizo to take a seat. Um, so uh, we'll call this uh, special Tura meeting to order at um, 4.15. Um, roll call. Board member Panamera. 4.10, I'm sorry. Here. Board member Pastizo as alternate. Here. And Chair Ayers Flood. Yeah, here, uh, here. Um, just so just for good housekeeping, um, uh, our first act will just uh, be to seat uh, our alternate um, in place of uh, the regular subcommittee member on a buyers. I don't think there's a motion necessary. Um, buyers is, is absent. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so with that, um, Let's go ahead and, and start the discussion with the staff report. Elaine, do you wanna go ahead and, and kick us off? I do. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, tonight we want to talk about housing uh, again a little bit and then to talk about um, economic development. So Nikki is going to start out just showing us a map of uh, undeveloped land and land on which we don't think permits have been pulled. And then I want to go through the uh, spreadsheet just on housing investments that I sent through earlier today. And I can do that by sharing screen. And then we'll get input from you all <coughs> whether you've been able to gain any input on economic development. Um, and Mayor, I'm so sorry you're having rebound things. I, all of my COVID friends in our age group are having the same thing where they got COVID, thought they were getting better, and then all of a sudden it jumps back. So I'm, I'm sorry you're having that experience. Thank you, Elaine. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate hearing that too. So I, I don't feel... Yeah. You don't feel yeah. Um, so Nikki, do you want to share screen? And Nikki just has uh, time with us until 4.30 and then she has another commitment. Oh, and I should interject. I need to be finished at five. Okay. And I, I guess I just want to really quickly state also for the record, uh, because there are um, some attendees that are maybe new to this discussion, is that, um, you know, this is a subcommittee meeting appointed by the TORA board. Uh, and our task is to refine uh, some of the information on the work plan um, specific to housing, uh, economic development, and other items. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Nikki, it's the, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you for having me here. Um, what I am going to show you today are, are just some very preliminary ideas about undeveloped land. And of course, there are many ways of looking at underdeveloped land or undeveloped land particularly within the context of recovery. Um, so what I was directed to do was to look at lands that potentially are not only vacant, but don't have uh, building permits or land use permits uh, currently in our system. And what we're gonna see is that uh, the that analysis does result in a big picture idea, but uh, next week I'm going to be meeting with uh, the planning department with Kristen and with Kim and with Jordan to take a really close look at the results of that analysis and to fine tune things. Um, this kind of, like I said, gives us that big picture view, but there are going to be instances where 
the queries that were used to develop this map are not going to be completely reflective of developable, developability. I always struggle to, to spit that word out. Um, so again, what we're looking at here, uh, you see in green uh, areas that potentially have some redevelopment uh, potential. Um, now that doesn't make any observations about uh, you know, what the landowner has in mind for this land. It just means that our initial, initial analysis um, has targeted these areas as being um, having improved values, not improved assessed values, but improved values of $1,000 or less. And they don't have any kind of building permit or land use permit on them. So what I've done is I've taken each of the tax lots and I've indicated, is it inside or outside of the Tura boundary? Uh, does it intersect with a damage assessment from the county that is reflective of major or uh, destroyed levels of damage? Um, does the uh, does the tax lot intersect with a land use permit? And we kind of narrowed down some of those parameters for both land use and building permits um, to try to target just recovery permitting. It's not a hundred percent correct just because of the way that some of the permitting is and and how we have to query it. Um, and that'll be one of the things that I work with the planning department next week to refine. I also have listed what type of city zoning uh, is present on this piece of property. And again, does it have less than $1,000 in improved value? And does it meet all of the criteria that we have looked at so far for developability? Everything in Gray has something else going on with it. it uh, it's valued at over $1,000 for improved value, or it has permits uh, associated with it. So we think we have kind of our preliminary idea of where we can start looking. Um, and next week, we'll be refining this further. And with that, does anyone have any questions so far? Elaine, was there anything you wanted to touch on specifically yeah. about the map? I, we asked Nikki to do this just because we had the question in the meeting, um, the, the prior meeting, just about where this development can go. Do we have parcels where this development that we're hoping to encourage and incentivize can go? Um, and so th this map will help um, just identify where there are parcels just for us to, to recognize and see. We haven't gone the step further of saying, well, these parcels could uh, hold X amount of housing units on them or anything like that. And I, Mayor, would you like me to facilitate um, for the rest of the meeting so you don't have to worry about looking for people or would you like to keep doing that? No, Elaine, uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. Okay, Member Panamaroff, I think you were first. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, I, Nikki, you may have said this. Um, are you also doing an overlay of like environmentally impacted, like floodplain and stuff like that on this site? Yeah, I think we I will be it. doing that. Yeah, no, we will be doing that. This was uh, just this initial sweep of potential properties so that we know where to look more closely. And one of the things that this does not yet reflect are environmental constraints or other constraints to development on these sites. So that will definitely be something that we'll be looking at very closely next week. Okay, great. Thanks. Member Pestizo? Um, yeah, maybe this is waiting to next week too. I was a little distracted when you started do you have the the size of the lots in there? Okay. If you click yeah. on each lot, it gives you that information. Yeah. I guess more specifically yeah. was the when you had your is this um, I guess ready, but I forget your term. You know, meet the criteria for further development was the size of the tax lot part of that consideration? 
It was not. And my understanding now is that we'll be looking at properties that are, I believe, a quarter of an acre or larger. Is that correct? Okay. And one thing that we can do is we, when we whittle this list down a bit further, we can bring this into our GIS urban and start to uh, take those parcel lines, those tax lots, and actually test out some scenarios with uh, combining tax lots or changing them in ways that will accommodate uh, multifamily development. Chair Ayers Flood. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I know that we have a cherry stem that goes up to the property that's on the other side of the railroad tracks off of Rapp Road. Um, is there, and, and Elaine, you mentioned the other day that, you know, once we evaluate this, if there's any reason to, to move our district lines in order to better serve a housing analysis. Um, this piece that is um, on the other side of the railroad tracks, if we were to move into some of that or all of that, would that require us to diminish the size of the district elsewhere? It would because we're at just under 25% uh, now and 25% of the total city acreage is the limitation. So yeah, we, we would have to um, reduce in order to add anything. Because of the size of that acreage, Nikki, is what? Can you click on it? Uh, I don't have the acreage of the Tura boundary right now, but you you can. Um, were you talking about just things that are inside of the yeah, boundary no, what right I'm, now? What I'm asking you to do is if you would click on the parcel that's on the other side of the railroad tracks. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, and it's green. It's a rather large this, piece. This one right here? Yeah, uh, yeah I yeah. see what you're talking about now. Thank you. Yeah, so it looks like it's a little over 14 acres. So if we wanted to bring that in, we would need to reduce about 12 acres, I think, from somewhere else within the current proposed Tura boundary. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sure. And I think, Nikki, um, can you or did you already send out a link to this? So if people wanted to look at it, they could go in and look at it. I, I know you sent me one. I don't know if anybody else got it. Not yet. I think the thinking is that we'll whittle this down okay. further with planning okay. next week before we send it out. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of work to do yet, as we've discussed, and, and we don't want to you sure. know, give the impression that this is a, a completed product um, sure. until we get some of those those questions answered. Um, I think this is a work in progress. Sure. Chair, did you have another question? No. Member Panamarov? Yeah, I'm not sure it would make a big difference. I'm just wondering about if we um, if we factor out uh, when you say parcels, do you mean tax lots or do you mean contiguous? Yeah, you. if um, if we far if we um, part sorry if we um, filtered out um, you know smaller lots when maybe we'd have a situation where several contiguous lots of a small size actually um, make a, a good size parcel. I'd I'd mm -hmm. hate to lose that if it was uh, something that could work out really well, um, but I don't know that that's um, as a practical matter, uh, making it super hard. No, I, th I think that's a good idea uh, to explore and I'll definitely bring that up with planning next week. Um, I don't think there are too many properties that we're gonna be discussing that are you know, really small slivers, but I'll definitely take a look and see. Um, one thing I think with the, the quarter acre is just, that's kind of our, you know, standard area where we know we can put at least a single family unit on. And so, you know, in planning that that's kind of a magic number for us. But I agree if there's things that, you know, are contiguous with other lots that can be redeveloped and we can add in those lands, you know, even if it's a tenth of an acre, if it's if it's going to be enough to allow for setbacks or, you know, parking, things like that, then I think that's important to include. 
Thanks. Yeah, it seems like a way to think about it is we could look for tax lots or or contiguous groups of tax lots that meet or approach that quarter acre. Yeah. And I just want to make clear to anybody who is listening, that does not mean anything except looking at potential development. It doesn't mean the agency's planning on buying anything. It that doesn't um, mean anything at this point other than looking at potential capacity within this area for future development. So I, I want anybody listening not to worry about their property being identified for something. Yeah, this is actually yeah. something planning departments do as a matter of course in the background just to keep track. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Nikki, did you have any questions for anybody? I know you need to leave fairly soon. <coughs> no, no. I think uh, several good points have been brought up, and I will bring those to attention next week when I meet with city staff. Great, thank you. Um, You're welcome. You want to? I'll go okay. ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, if you want to unshare, I had something else to share. So. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. I'll go ahead and drop off now. Have a great weekend, everyone. Excuse me. Hi, Nikki. Nikki, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. <coughs> so are you seeing the spreadsheet up on my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So going, <coughs> I just got some dust in my throat, sorry. I was going to say, how did I give you my cold, Elaine? Yeah. I've just been zooming. <laughs> it just, I got, I, you know, I, I still have my tonsils, unfortunately, which means whenever I get dust or something in my throat, it gets stuck in my tonsils and then I act a fool for a bit and then move on. So um, I took some of the information that I presented um, two nights ago and tried to put it into an analysis of how much money those kinds of scenarios cost, just to be helpful in terms of us trying to specify goals <laughs> for housing units, <coughs> excuse me, and approximately how much money we might allocate to those. So in the top rows um, that we have here, I was looking at a 50 unit development and looking at both a per market, uh, real market value of 300,000 and 350,000 because the people uh, to whom I spoke had ranges between that. And so I thought it would be interesting to look at those ranges um, and what, <coughs> Rebates might be depending on what percentage um, incentive we looked at. So really the lowest percentage incentive that people talked about was around 13%. So if you're doing a unit development that has 50 units in it and you're putting in 13% of that total real market value, the rebate would be about $1.95 million. So in, in terms of planning, and these are all in 2022 dollars. So it, when we would put these in the spreadsheet, those numbers inflate over time by the inflation rate we're using in the plan. Um, if the cost per unit is $350,000, then at the same amount, your Tura would be putting in like $2.275 million. So, those are kind of the, the ranges at the bottom end, so 13%. At 15%, so just <clears throat> bumped up a little bit, at 300,000 per unit, um, the incentive would be 2.25 million. And at 15% uh, for a 350,000, it would be 2.625. And then 
I know Tualatin is looking at thinking that they might have to go up to 20%. So I just put that in as a sidebar for us to think about um, at a 20% uh, investment it would go up to about $3 million for uh, if the per unit cost was $300,000. And if the per unit cost were three fifty, dollars it would be $3.5 million. So that's based on um, a 50-unit development <coughs> or, or 50 total units of development, Chair Airspud. I was just going to ask. Has Tualatin talked about why they would need to go up to 20%? Um, and, and you can answer that when you're done with your presentation. I apologize for interrupting. No, I think they're thinking they may get development that um, might be not limited to stick built, so the uh, higher construction costs. And they may have to do um, things on parking that would include uh, potentially some underground parking. So that makes costs, costs go up. Um, so I, I think that's why, and their land costs, um, I think are going to be higher also in the metro area than land costs um, are going to be in Southern Oregon. So- Follow-up follow up question, do they think, has there been any discussion that you know of where things that they can, they can create more density with some of these um, these options. Right. If you if you go higher than four floors and you have to um, do the higher um, construction costs, so you can't do stick built anymore. You you have to have um, a different type of construction. You can get more density. It just costs more. So okay, these, that, that that clarifies a lot. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> so these, um, I, I think in your area, you probably aren't thinking about, and I think the units that Jackson County Housing Authority has developed are stick built units. So they don't um, typically go above four floors. So we're limited, to, we're limited to three floors in this city. So yeah. So. Um, the next row of uh, scenarios are predicated on more units, 100 units. Of course, if you're going to do 100 units, uh, if you're going to do it on one parcel, you need a much bigger parcel. It could be uh, the housing authority had told us that you need 40 to 50 units together to really make their developments work. That's why I use the 50 up here. 100 could be two separate developments or um, you know you could go up to 120, so it's three separate developments of 40, but this just lets you know on the, this range of costs um, what that rebate amount might be as, as you're looking at the total maximum indebtedness you have over time, what amount of money it might take to provide those incentives for that kind of um, development. So obviously the numbers double with 100 units. And, and I mostly did that because I, I'm not sure what your goal of how many units you want to, how many units the city wants to increase in multifamily development. Um, so I just wanted to provide that information for us to talk through. Um, and then on single family, um, I had uh, Nick and Allie help me with this, um, the financial advisor. In our financial projections, we're looking at um, potential new development coming on, and we were told to use 360000 as a real market value for that um, increased value. So that is the value not really of the land, that's the value of the increase um, so the building you put on. And if you use the uh, change property ratio that the assessor uses to establish assessed value, which is 0.63, um, you come down to an assessed value of 226,800. Your tax rate is 14.3719. That's the permanent rate, not doesn't include bonds, local option levies or anything like that. Um, 
And so the first year of taxes on that fiscal year in 2024 would be um, $3,460. So I asked the, uh, Nick and Allie to give me what that amount would be accounting for taxes going up over time and the values going up over time for seven, 10, 15, and 20 year periods, just to look at thinking about, well, what kind of uh, rebate would that be? So a seven year period would be a rebate of uh, $26,511. A 10 year period would be just under 40,000. A 15 year period would be 64, uh, 349, and then a 20 year period, 92, 966. So when we were talking about making units affordable over the long term, you know, if you're looking at somebody who's building these to rent um, and you're trying to get them to do affordable units for the long term, you may have to provide a longer term of rebate. If you're looking to just get affordable units built, and resold to someone, and maybe you put, uh, maybe you say, if we're going to help give this rebate, um, we want to put limitations on the income of people who buy these so that we know they're going to people within the, the income range we're trying to establish, but we don't care what happens after that. So that that's that issue that we talked about last week of initial affordability, but then that moves into uh, a unit where people can create some wealth by owning a home. So uh, if you're looking at doing something like that, then you probably don't need that rebate for a longer period because the, the rebate is really keeping the price low, keeping the price lower, and you really, if anybody's going to do that, it's only going to keep, they're, they're only going to agree to that if keeping that price lower, um, you know, equals to the amount of money they're going to get in a rebate. Otherwise, they have no incentive to join your program and, and to do that. So what value you would have to make to um, keep that price low, um, you know, we, we would have to talk to property owners and builders and see. When we developed the program for John Day, we, we developed it at a certain threshold, knowing that the city might have to go in and change those thresholds if um, they weren't able to get the development that they were looking for, given the thresholds that were established. So I, I believe that establishing thresholds within our plan and um, as shown in the report, is acceptable uh, within the knowledge that as you start rolling out a program, depending on whether you're looking for long-term affordability or you're looking for selling to people within certain price range, um, you, you may have to adjust what those thresholds are, but you at least have data to help provide sidebars for an initial um, look at what those programs might be. So questions on any of this? <clears throat> Member Panamara? So not so much on this, but I kind of had a lingering question from um, our last discussion about um, uh, maintaining affordability uh, over time, which mm -hmm. I think we said you could do with the deed restriction or some sort of mechanism and also um, building wealth, wealth um, for families, um, especially folks who, who have been historically disadvantaged. I'm wondering though, and it, this seems like to me to work out mathematically, but I'm not sure if it's um, policy wise, um, a sensible policy that in a way to do both in, in the sense that um, if you're, you're helping a, a family get into um, ownership of, of a property, but they're restricted to when they sell, it has to be at a certain level. Um, is it the case that you actually are building some wealth? Um, maybe not as much wealth if they were going to sell it at market rate, but at some degree of wealth, um, 
at least, you know, enough to um, uh, level up in terms of uh, buying, um, okay. you know, so is there, is there, do, do people do combinations that kind of balance? Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot, a, a lot of, I'm trying to think if I know of any recent programs where once they get somebody in, so I was thinking about initial sell to that family who met those income criteria. So limiting that the, the builder who has this lot that's worth X amount, um, they've put a real market value of 360. And so let's, let's say that gets them a $460,000 house, but they know they can get 520 for it because of, you know of the profit that they're going to get. So you, to be able to run this program where you're reselling it, you have to make your rebate good enough that um, I, I guess to cover whatever profit that that builder thinks they're losing out on. So that doesn't answer your question, um, but gives some further explains what I was trying to say. To answer your question, um, I, many years ago, was involved in a home ownership program in Portland that I developed, um, where in the first five years, um, for each year that the homeowner lived in that property, um, any percent profit on sale was split between the agency who developed the program and the homeowner. After five years, they were no longer limited. Um, I, I, I think it was felt like you were trying to provide some stability to the neighborhood. And if you could get people to live there five years, hopefully they would live there longer and, and re remain in the, the neighborhood. And it allowed them to get more into benefiting from that home ownership and creating wealth. So I know that was a model that was used in terms of whether all of that is legal now, we would have. We, we would, as you would develop a program, and these programs are usually developed after a plan is in place, and you say this is the kind of program you want, and you give sidebars for the types of money you think you want to invest, and then you actually develop the program, test the program um, after the urban renewal area is created. So uh, you you we would need to check to make sure those kinds of programs. Um, are legal. I, I know in Portland, um, that the group that I told you I'm working with in Cully, um, we've come up against a, a problem where we were looking at giving first right to BIPOC um, people and uh, Black Indigenous people of color. And uh, their legal counsel has advised them that we have got to word that differently that there have been some recent court cases that um, are not going to allow us to say that specifically. So um, if, if we're looking to say under dis, underserved um, individuals in your community, we, we would have to probably go through that same legal review to make sure whatever we're saying is gonna pass that legal um, test. Member Pastizo? Oh, well, you may have cover just covered this point but some years ago I was offered a job mm. at, for the city of Santa Barbara and their housing prices were crazy expensive and so they did have houses that sounds like what you're describing I don't remember the specifics but you know if you worked for the city and which is a little different again if you work for the city you could buy these and you could accumulate some of the you know, increasing costs, but not all of them. And there is some math involved. I can't remember, but it sounds pretty similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. So again, all of those details would have to be worked out as, as you do the program. But I, I think there was interest, not only just in looking at multifamily uh, units, but also in trying to create affordable single family units. Um, so this, this is at least a methodology for how to get there, um, but fine tuning that methodology and then testing it with um, 
builders and developers and people who own property and saying, you know, what are the thresholds we would have to do to make this program work um, is something that you could do as you develop the, the program as part of the plan. Member Panamara. Yeah, I just wanted to say this is really helpful. And I see that this can be this could be a very flexible program. And if I'm understanding correctly, um, looking at the first uh, two sets of rows, the land acquisition is not a, a preliminary step. It's not like we have to acquire the land. We're just working with a developer who's figured out who has acquired the land and is figuring out right. how much it will cost them. And we're incentivizing right. um, for various outcomes. And, and, and this shows how our uh, tax increment financing um, can support right. um, those rebates. Um, so yeah, I think this, this looks like a really uh, a nice uh, flexible tool. Um, and uh yeah, I think as far as when you're talking about the the tweaks in the in the programs and stuff, I like um, I think that that as long as you know the values are clear in terms of you know creating our affordable housing, right. um, community <clears throat> continuity, um, all of that, all of that stuff, um, that it, it will evolve over time right. and necessarily so. Right. And, the, and this does not preclude you from having as part of your toolbox just acquisition. Acquisition. So if a parcel became available um, and you had a willing seller, you could acquire that parcel. You could either sell it to a developer or you could use, you know, it, the housing authority said acquisition to them is the biggest tool because th uh, they then don't have to carry the cost of that land while they're doing all of their pre-development activity and their development activity. So it is, is really beneficial. So depending on what kind of development you want, you, you can have different tools in your toolbox. So these would be a, a potential rebate tool for multifamily and single family, but another tool could be acquisition. Another tool could be um, assisting with system development charges, um, and that would be paid out of that direct tax tax increment um, funds that you're going to be getting. Member Panamara? Yeah, and I just want to say, um, I think that sounds great. I think as far as STCs go, my my sense of based on, you know, uh, the the experience we've had here, that those are you know a case by case basis mm -hmm. um, that we work with the developer and um, it's extremely flexible um, and it's really just having the money to be able to do it. Um, as far as as the land acquisition goes, I guess that's also kind of case by case flexible um, that you don't really necessarily need a, a defined program for, um, but you could call it out in the plan that this would be uh, mm -hmm. one of one of the tools in the tools box. I love the way you phrase that. Yeah. So acquisition is always a an activity in an urban renewal plan that is acceptable. But a lot of times if the entity is wanting to use it under a certain uh, other program like housing, we relist it there just to make it clear that the intention um, is also to use it for um, housing development or commercial development if you know if 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 that's applicable so uh, we we would go ahead and put it under both categories the housing and we can talk about the commercial um, next but the housing and just as an overall authority member pastizo and just a quick question with the sdcs if the if the developer isn't paying them, then the city's not getting those resources. Is does the does the urban renewal agency compensate the city at all when that sort of thing happens? Yeah, the okay. urban renewal agency pays the SDCs for the developer. Okay, for a portion right. of doesn't have to pay all of them. Mayor Iyersblood. Yeah, um, I uh, just wanted to follow up on the comment you made about acquisition and and listing it in both. And in a conversation uh, I was having with um, 
I don't even know who I was talking to about it, but um, when uh, when land acquisition is part of the um, programs uh, that are available, does it make sense to make land acquisition its own definition and then and then you know broaden um, broaden the different types of uses as much as you possibly can? So you know even if it's um, land acquisition for right of ways or for um, for housing development or for, you know, but, but is there, is there a good reason, I guess is what I'm asking to make land acquisition its own, its own category? Is, is it even um, necessary? Yeah. Uh, yes. And let, let me, let me say, there's a portion, there are portions of the urban renewal plan that are in every urban renewal plan that give you the authority to do tax increment financing, that give you the authority to do property acquisition. And, and that verbiage goes in every single urban renewal plan because it's authority provided under the statute that you then implement through adopting an urban renewal plan. The, the Statute also says that you have to identify the projects within the plan and the dollars allocated to those projects. So that's why if we're if we're planning on using acquisition under housing, we will typically identify um, just that it's one of the projects allowed in acquisition, just so that uh, it nobody challenges you being able to use it for that. So. Um, I, I guess that's called the belt and suspenders, the, you know, where, where you cover yourself in both places, just to make sure there is no confusion that you have an overall authority for acquisition and you definitely intend to use and implement that authority in um, doing housing projects. Right. I, I mean, I'm hearing you say that that makes it really clear. I'm hearing you say that um, that um, if it's our intention to, you know, to just really use the tool to its greatest advantage, that the objective really is to is to make sure that you identify as many of those programs. And generally, right, you don't need to say we're going to purchase this piece of property and do that. You know, we're just generally saying, yes. uh, OK, great. At, at, um, the statute does say before you actually acquire a piece of property, it has to be identified. But rarely do we identify property in an original urban renewal plan um, that because then, uh, unfortunately, if anyone thinks that a governmental agency is going to be acquiring their property, that suddenly the price goes way up. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, sometimes there's blind negotiations on property and um, it's it just that once once you have signed an agreement to acquire a piece of property, before you actually do the acquisition, you are supposed to identify it. And that's just a minor amendment to your plan that's passed by a resolution of your agency. So that's a small step that has to happen when you acquire property, um, but it doesn't have to happen up front. You don't have to identify properties that might be acquired now. Okay, great, thank you. That was really helpful. And the other thing, just for anybody listening, the uh, a number of years ago, the citizens of Oregon um, changed eminent domain so that a governmental agency may not um, take private property and then resell it to somebody for other private development. So um, the agency could not use condemnation or eminent domain to take a piece of private property and then turn around and sell it to a private housing developer. So um, they they still have eminent domain powers for putting in infrastructure and for doing public facilities, but not for private to private. So uh, I know people always, when they hear acquisition, they get worried about that because um, there have been uses of urban renewal where that's happened. So if we're if we're done with this, I, what I am going to ask Nick and Ali to do is to um, 
plug in some of these to our finance plan so that we can look at over time what those costs might be. Um, and, and I think you know, we'll start with potentially trying to create 100 um, multifamily units. And I, I think if you guys have any guidance on how many single family units um, you, you want to try to think about, and, and maybe we don't know that kind of number until we uh, finish that exercise that Nikki is working on. Um, but, but the reality is I'm not sure we're gonna finish that exercise until we're going to need help, a plan developed uh, and ready to go out. So, um, I'm, and I'm not asking you to give me any numbers now, but to think about numbers on single family. And um, maybe by Monday night, we'll have a, a little more sidebars to give us on how much of that development could happen. Um, so if it's okay with you, we, we will start with the hundred of the multifamily and just kind of see how we can put that into the spreadsheet over time. and. Um, and go from there. And the, uh, and the next part of our agenda was to look at um, or see if we are, were able to gain any input on economic development needs. Um, so I'm gonna unshare here and get back to us. Um, and I know um, the chair said she was going to do some, but if you're not feeling well, I'm, I don't know how much you could have gotten done. But uh, I, did, I actually did um, some yesterday and I've got calls out uh, waiting for return calls, too. Um, but uh, I did have um, a couple of really great conversations yesterday. And the, the one pattern I'm seeing just as a preview, um, what I'd like to do is just assemble the information and provide this group with you know uh, a summary and then um of course a copy of my notes and um but uh you know um the preview i'd like to offer is that uh, the commercial property owners that i've talked to are a trying to rebuild in talent want to reopen their businesses the ones that i did got got a hold of were all property owners that had previous businesses and wanted to, um, can, you know, wanted to reopen, but are facing um, the same challenges that a lot of the homeowners reported, where they were grossly underinsured for the same reasons that we're all aware of. Um, insurance just doesn't cover um, like everybody thinks it does, and um, and also um, the cost of inflation was not just you know, a spike in building costs as a result of the fire, but then there was that incredible inflation that happened across the nation. Um, <coughs> excuse me, widening the gap um, between the amount that they received, which was not enough to begin with, and um, and then uh, the amount that they'd actually need to rebuild. And then here was a really interesting aspect is that there were elements of the, um, two things, uh, elements of the commercial rebuild that their insurance didn't necessarily cover, like parking lots, which are extremely expensive to rebuild. Um, and those are things that are required when you update, right? So if you didn't have necessarily a parking lot then, but you are going and you were grandfathered and you're going to build a business and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then um, the other interesting comment was um, commercial building codes being so different uh, and so much more expensive. Um, so anyway, in one conversation, I was able to kind of ascertain the, the gap um, between what they received and what they actually need to completely open their doors. Because the other issue was in one case, um, the, the other issue was that coverage of the inventory needed, the furniture and fixtures and the inventory needed to, um, to operate was also um, under provided for, right? So, um, he described it as, you know, uh, the insurance company said it's the contents of your building. If you were able to re uh, pick up your building and dump it out onto the street, what would fall out? And um, 
and the coverage for that was so um, so underrated. And and really, the housing uh, sector said the same thing. The those folks who lost their homes said a lot of the same things. But the difference is that if you're a homeowner and you rebuild your house, you don't have to put a couch in in order to move back in. Um, but you have to have inventory in order to open your doors. Mm -hmm. So like it was an extraordinarily enlightening conversation. And so, so far, my intel so far is that the gap, the financing gap is much wider than it was for housing for various reasons. Uh, most, imp most important to keep in mind is just getting your building up to the current commercial code. Um, and where it may not have been, where it may, where so many of our buildings were very old and mm -hmm. with a lot of grandfathering going on. That's just not the case anymore. Um, but we estimated um, a gap. Um, and by we, I mean, you know, he spelled out, they spelled out some of their um, losses and I added them up and we were looking at like 450, 450 to $500,000 um, needed for uh, a couple of these businesses to to make to be whole again, you know, to be able to open their doors and and be up to code and have enough inventory um, or product, whatever the case may be, uh, in order to get back uh, to the business. And the interesting thing that um, and and I'm sorry, this is a long preview, but I uh, I hope to get you some more information. Like the interesting other piece of this is that because there's such a lack of response um, for aid in recovering for-profit businesses, like literally, even with the SBCA, um, the SBA, um, like it's difficult to get loans, et cetera. Because of that, um, there's also a loss incurring as these folks are unable to reopen their doors. So um, if you take uh, one um, retail, um, retail retailer, for example, um, he could have been open and, and doing business probably in six months, which means that, which means that as of whatever that was, March of 2020 or April of 2020, he could have been making a living. And since then, because of all of this, whatever, you know, this, this gap, this financial gap, he continues to incur loss um, as, as the, you know, the loss uh, uh, of time and money. And so, um, uh, you know, obviously those are not all things that we're gonna be able to address, but I have to say it was an enlightening day yesterday and I look forward to getting back to it Monday morning. I, I always find conversations with people we're trying to serve are um, so enlightening. Um, yeah. So I, I, I just want to say for my colleagues one more thing. Um, one of the one of the people I spoke with said, "If I knew then what I know now, I would have not tried to rebuild." Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's disheartening. Yeah, and, and it's probably revealing when we look at how many how many permits we've got pulled. Right. In that in that sector. Right. 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 Well, I know Member Pastizo said he needed to leave at five. And I think this actually covers the information that we are trying to cover today. So on Monday, I think we'd like to hopefully have more information on the commercial front. I um, will see if we have time to plug in some of the information into the finance plan over time for the housing to see how how that works just in terms of capacity um, over dollars. I mean, I, I know we have enough money in the very first that you could do a, a, a big project at the beginning, uh, a big housing project, if, if indeed there was land available to do that. Um, but allocating all that money up front, and, and I know that um, Jordan is going to be ready to talk about the hazard mitigation 
um, which she feels is the number one priority to, to do. Um, so it'll be an interesting conversation Monday night to be able to help fill out some more um, sidebars for us. And, uh, and we move that to two. Did, did we move it to two or not? I put out a request to see where other people were at um, because I thought I heard that you and Jordan were meeting at two anyway, so that you'd both we be have, available. We have a two o'clock meeting. And I know that something came up for uh, the mayor at four. Um, Dave, are you uh, free at two? Um, I could be. It wouldn't be ideal for me because I have to take vacation time to be there. Wow. But, yeah, um, I know. I hear you there. Yeah. Me too. But, um, I do want to also say that in the event that two o'clock ends up not working, uh, Pastizo has agreed to fill my seat in my absence. At the four o'clock. Right. But whatever we, we have to kind of decide now. So if Hector had to renotice, there would be enough time, right, Hector? Uh, yes, Council, that's why I raised my hand, but I'm, I'm listening attentively and I'll take a note. If you guys decide to change the time, I'll, I'll make that arrangement. Well, I think it's important um, for the mayor to be there because she's doing a lot of the this outreach to the, yeah. um, on the economics. So let's change it to two and um, we'll just make the best of it. Thank you, Member Pestizo. Hey, Dave, do they let you work at night to make up the hours so you don't have to burn vacation? Um, I don't know. Possibly. I'll have to investigate. <laughs> That's my little trick. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Right. So it sounds like we will, we will, um, we will uh, re-notify for 2 p.m. on Monday. So otherwise, same, uh, same agenda otherwise, just 2 o'clock instead of 4 o'clock. Okay. So that's cool, Hector. Yes, Councillor, I'll make the arrangements as soon as I can. Thank you. And I can let Anna know in case she can make it. Right. If she can make it, and then Member Pastizo wouldn't have to take time off. So, um, yeah, that would be great. All right, thank you very much and have a nice weekend, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, huh. all. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Bye-bye.